Have you been considering a spinal injection for back pain and maybe you're wondering if they actually work or are they just a short term fix? My name's Anthony Gosh, I'm a consultant spinal neurosurgeon and director of the Spine MDT. In this video, I'm going to explain the different types of spine injections and my approach to using them. Firstly, what do we actually inject into the spine? Well, the substance is actually a mixture of a local anesthetic, which is fast acting and helps numb up the area. And that's mixed with a corticosteroid, a type of drug that suppresses inflammation. So the local anesthetic acts fairly quickly and helps alleviate the pain just for a few hours or a day or so. But the steroid can take anything from a few days to two or three weeks to take effect. Now let's quickly run through the anatomy so that we can understand the targets for the injections. So here is the human spine. It's made up of a stack of bones from the skull all the way down the back to the pelvis. Um, each bone is called a vertebrae, which is a cylindrical block of bone at the front if we zoom in with an arch of bones at the back. If we stack these up together, they form a tunnel in the middle of the spine that goes all the way up to the skull. And that tunnel contains the spinal cord and the nerves that transmit messages between the brain and the spine. Each block of bone is connected to the other at the front with this cushion called a disc, which is a type of shock absorber and a facet joint at the back, which allows a little bit of movement. And if we look at a cross section, there's a facet joint on either side at each level. And then of course, these bones are strapped together by ligaments. And at each level in the spine, there is a window either side through which a nerve leaves the spine. Now deep in the pelvis, there is the sacrum of the spine and the tailbone. And this is really important so that we can understand caudal epidural injections, which we'll discuss first. A caudal epidural demonstrated in this x-ray here. This is the back, this is the front, and here we can see the sacrum of the spine, the very bottom of the spine here, and then the tailbone down here. So the needle is passed deep down in the buttock cleft, very low down in your back at the buttock area. And here at the very bottom of the spine, just above the tailbone is a very thin membrane that allows us to enter into the spinal canal and inject the substance up so that it goes into the canal, but outside of the lining of the spine. I am personally very critical of this injection and almost never carry this out. It's often used when there isn't really a clear target that we suspect is the source of the back pain so that the steroid and anesthetic mixture just go up and go everywhere in the hope that it will reach the target or whatever the cause of the pain is. And in my experience, it only gives a very short lived result. I like to look for a very specific target that I believe might be causing the back pain. If you have sciatica, pain radiating down your leg, secondary to a disc herniation, pinching a nerve, then an injection called a transferaminal epidural can be helpful. The transferaminal means through the foramen. So that's this window we spoke about earlier here where the nerve leaves the spine and we target the disc adjacent to the nerve. Again, this is carried out under x-ray guidance demonstrated here with a view of the front of the spine. The needle is passed through the skin of the back from one side and enters that window in the spine here. A bit of contrast or dye is injected into the spine to ensure that the stuff we're injecting goes where we want it to go, adjacent to the nerve and the disc. A recent study called the NERVES trial compared patients undergoing a transferaminal nerve block for sciatica with patients undergoing surgery. And the two groups had quite similar results, but 35% of patients allocated to the injection group ended up needing an operation. So my approach to people with sciatica from nerve compression is to offer the injection as a first line invasive measure as it is less invasive than an operation. If that fails, then we can proceed to surgery, which would be a microdiscectomy linked in a video below. Another target is the facet joint demonstrated on this x-ray here. Here's the front of the spine, here's the back, and this line here, this joint is the facet joint. The trouble is it's often difficult to determine if that truly is the source of pain. So we do have to investigate this quite well. 
If it is the source of pain, then injecting a bit of uh, steroid and local anesthetic to one of the branches that innervates that, that facet joint can be helpful, but often that gives temporary alleviation of pain. However, it is a good diagnostic tool. If you get suppression of your back pain from this injection, that means that is likely to be the source of the pain. And then there are other procedures we can proceed to. One of which is radiofrequency denervation, where a needle is passed onto the joint directly and then the nerve endings, just the last final branches of those nerves deep in the joint are burnt to desensitize the joint altogether. And therefore, I mostly use this injection as a diagnostic procedure. If it is the source of the pain, I ask one of my colleagues, a pain specialist, to try the radiofrequency denervation. All that does really is give you a bigger window of pain alleviation. During that time, that's when I expect my physiotherapy or osteopathy colleagues to intervene with some exercise therapy to build a brace of muscle around that segment, which can give you longer term alleviation. Lastly, I want to talk about the sacroiliac joint injection. The sacroiliac joint demonstrated here is where the pelvis joins on to the side of the spine demonstrated here. This joint doesn't actually move very much, it's kind of like a shock absorber between the legs and the spine, but it can be a source of pain. Often the pain is very low down in the spine, but towards one side, and it can radiate into the glutes, the buttock, or the back of thigh. Again, it's really important that we do a good clinical assessment with various tests to determine if this is the source. And once again, the injection directly into that joint is often diagnostic to determine that, but can give you a reasonable length of time of alleviation of pain, during which some good physiotherapy, strengthening exercises, uh, building up the gluteus medius muscle and other surrounding muscles can be helpful. If it does give you alleviation, once again, radiofrequency denervation of this joint, where you burn the nerve endings again, can give you a longer period of alleviation. But once again, this isn't a cure. It just buys you that bigger window of time where you're under better pain control, where you can actually do and tolerate these exercises. So to summarize, the transferaminal epidural injection for sciatica is quite useful at giving even long-term results in people with leg pain from nerve compression demonstrated by the trial. The other injections, such as the facet injection or the sacroiliac joint injection, I often use as a diagnostic tool in preparation for further treatment uh, thereafter, be it radiofrequency, sometimes surgery, but more often than not, physiotherapy. The caudal epidural injection that I mentioned at the very beginning, I very, very rarely use. Sometimes the pain specialists I work with may use this as a break in the overall pain cycle when we haven't found the cause and aren't getting anywhere with the other modes of therapy, such as physiotherapy or osteopathy. That little break in the pain cycle can help kickstart that rehabilitation process. As always, I really hope you found this video helpful. If so, please click that like button and do subscribe to the channel. Also, so visit us at spinemdt.com for further information and to find out how we can help you. Thank you for watching.